morning, everyone. We've also got a, uh, a fairly large panel. Uh, let's start by having uh, <clears throat> Matt Lovett from Pop Sigma. We've got uh, we've got Scarlett Lee from Zebra Media. Uh, we've got Thomas Reamer from 88TC88. Uh, we've got <clears throat> Mark Rossetti from Two Muse. We've got John Cox from the Gravity Group. And we have Gonzalo Ferrero from 54F. We'll, uh, I think we have our work cut out for us, keeping the, uh, <clears throat> you know, maintaining the energy level of the previous panel, but we'll, uh, we'll do our best. Um, <clears throat> bit of a big panel, so let's, uh, let's maybe just start with some very quick introductions to, uh, to each of the, the panelists, their companies, what they're doing. Uh, <clears throat> maybe starting with you, Matt, everyone, 10 words or less. Pop Sigma is a Shanghai-based digital marketing agency. Uh, we basically were formed to unlock the power of celebrities, media, entertainment, and uh, mostly digital marketing formats. Thomas. Thomas Rima, 88tc88.com. We uh, bringing foreign content to China to put it up on the three big mobile carriers and uh, sell the music. It's a start for a very normal service that uh, people can believe in and uh, believe that it's very transparent. Um, Gons Ferrero from 54F. Uh, it's a brand new project um, for China, in China, um, to drive artist and fan engagement online. Scarlett. Uh, yes, Scarlett uh, Lee uh, from Zebra Media. Uh, we are in uh, event um, promotion, uh, music festivals, uh, TV, um, also services to the mobile operators. Uh, Mark Rossetti, uh, speaking for Two Muse. And Two Muse, we're designing background music solutions for brands, retail spaces uh, that are really looking to complete their environments out in China, you know, with high quality music and then distribute that throughout all of China to stores, shopping malls, restaurants, and uh, really enhance the customer experience. Uh, my name is John Cox with uh, Gravity Group Asia. We provide market entry and uh, market intelligence services for overseas digital media companies. Uh, we also work with a, a core team of Chinese media startups, uh, helping them drive their businesses in China, finding overseas clients, uh, providing them with operation support and uh, helping them grow in the Chinese market. Great, thanks. Um, I actually wanted to start with a little bit of context uh, setting. Uh, if you look at the perhaps, perhaps terribly not well chosen title of the session, Making Money in, Ch in China, It Can Be Done, um, that's, that's, that's basically a very sort of loaded uh, presentation of the concept, uh, built in assumption that it can't be done. Uh, even at the tail end of the last panel, this is like basically, um, <clears throat> you know, statements were made that nobody in China uh, pays for music. Uh, and I think, I think as, you know, we've hit this massive tipping point, this big inflection point in China, we need to be very careful when we're saying things n like uh, nobody pays for music in China. So I want to, I want to, I'm going to field an open question uh, to the panel, which is, do Chinese consumers pay for music? And more importantly, what do they pay for? Uh, I'll grab that quickly. Uh, they don't pay for a single song download on the internet. They take it for free, but they do pay for mobile services and uh, they pay a lot for it. But be under no illusion, the fraction of foreign music that they pay for is very, very, very low. But it's a beginning and it's a start. There haven't been enough services out there that you know go and jump through all the hoops to make that possible. There hasn't been any digital aggregation out there before to offer that service on scale. And uh, we've you know just changed that, and we also see the take up and the interest on that. So, if you want to create a sales platform in China for your stuff on uh, mobile, then uh, talk to us. I'd, I'd love to jump in as well. Um, <clears throat> we've actually, you know, that, that question is kind of the basis of our project um, and we've actually done a um, considerable amount of market research and spoken to people and it's basically, it's basically the question everywhere, right? But you can't, you can't sell something that people don't want. Um, so when you say, like, what do Chinese um, consumers, music fans pay for, 
Um, they don't pay, and, you know, they, they, nobody pays 10 quai for a 10 track download. Um, but, you know, as our research shows, actually, the, they do pay for, um, you know, exclusive access to, you know, merchandise from their favorite artists. Um, they pay for um, the feeling and the ability to show to all their friends that they are closer to their favorite artist than anybody else. Um, and they pay, you know, they, they do pay for that special, exclusive, you know, recognition that they are engaging with their artists and that's really what they want, right? And it's at the bottom of the, at the end of the day is really, are you offering to Chinese consumers um, something they value or are you offering to Chinese consumers something that they value and are willing to pay for? We're gonna, we're gonna come back to your research, which I, I think some of the research that you've done is absolutely fascinating. So we'll, we'll come back to that. I, I think it's also kind of a mistake to think about consumers as the only target market. Um, Selling to consumers, the, the, the price in China of a track of a CD is just zero dollars and zero cents, and that's it. Um, but if you're selling to a company, if you're selling to a company that wants music put together into a program, that wants music packaged, then that will sell. Because that's, that's something, you're not going to put piracy back in the bag. There's just no way to do it. It's out, it's done. But music as a product that can be packaged up and sold in different ways, that's a real way to make money off of music in China. I'm going I'm to ask Scarlett a question here since you, you, you know, opened Pandora's box with the piracy question. Uh, Scarlett, if you, um, you hold the best festivals across China with, with tens Thank of thousands you. of attendees every year. If you picked a thousand typical attendees out of the audience, uh, and put them in front of, say, Google's top 100 and, you know, historical Baidu, how many of those 1,000 uh, attendees would be able to tell you which was legal and which was, quote, pirated? They don't care. Can they tell the difference? Not really. They can't. They uh, can't because no. they haven't seen good service. I think uh, towards your question, I want to expand that a little bit uh, in terms of the, the topic of the panel, you know, who pays, you know. Um, just give you some figures. <clears throat> For China Mobile alone, each year they generate 2 billion RMB paid money to China Mobile from individual consumers on music products. 2 billion. Um, in terms of music programming on TV, um, in terms of advertising, PNG, the biggest advertiser uh, in terms of foreign investment on CCTV. CCTV per year generate 1.5, uh, 15 billion from advertising. So the consumer does pay in a strange way. What's the average price at your festivals? Uh, it, it varies in different cities. Um, average 100 kwai, which is 20, uh, uh, $15 per entry each day. And each of our festival, we have in average 100,000 people attending over the three days. So Mark, there's, uh, I know, <clears throat> and I think, uh, I think Scarlett, you're even, you've been involved in trying to get some legitimate download sites set up. Uh, I think. On my other startup. On your other startup. Um, but I know, and I'll, I'll share with the audience the fact that uh, I believe the, one of the packages is 20 renminbi. Uh, or about three US per month for 88 downloads, which is an average of how much? Five, five, five cents or something per yeah. download. Um, Mark, you, you've basically gone straight to the beat with two Muse, you've gone straight to the B2B side of the That's equation. Right. Tell us how this pricing works and, and what people are actually paying. Sure. Um, well, you know, this is going to vary based upon the size of the business, but. Broadly speaking, we're talking about $50 a month per store. And considering what that really does, I mean, good music is, is good business. Having a good sound in your store means you make more money. Why, why wouldn't they just steal the music? Or why wouldn't they use something else? Radio, CDs? Well, I mean, right now, that's the situation. People plug in an iPod and put on whatever their favorite music is. But if you've been to China, and if you haven't, I encourage you to go, you get the most bizarre music in nice restaurants. I mean, you're paying, you're paying for a good meal 
and you're getting weird 90s, 90s hip-hop cropping into this, you know, fancy restaurant soundtrack and just unusual, unusual mixes that is inspired by something, you, something that the manager picked up on the street corner for Five Kwai or something that he programmed on his iPod. It's nonsense. If you want to have a brand, a feeling, um, a complete consumer experience to give to your consumers, you need real programming. So you need someone with real customers music. care. Customers absolutely care. And international brands especially are immediately aware of the need for this level of quality and the need for this level of brand experience. People are paying 50 US a month for real music and real music programming. That's right. And is it just multinationals or are Chinese businesses? We already have it? Chinese business customers. Um, and that's, that's going to be you know, an even bigger and bigger market going forward. Very nice. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> I wanted you to tell us a little bit more about the research that you've done into what consumers are actually willing to pay for and what, uh, you know, when, when we're using the loaded term paying for music, what that actually means in, uh, in your universe. Yeah, sure. I mean, <clears throat> the, the, I mean the, the research is, is kind of almost kind of underlines exactly what everybody who's in China and in the music industry knows already, right? Um, and the, the, the previous panel actually got to it a little bit, right? But they, all these music fans, which are growing, you know, the, the, whole, the whole scene is you know, growing and prospering and little by little becoming much more important than it was before. And you know, the, the, the only way in which these guys are actually getting a lot, of their, you know, a lot of their interaction with artists is through these festivals that happen maybe once, twice, three times a year, and then the guys disappear for a while, right? So, you know, the, the, the heart of the research shows that, you know, that most people actually get their, discover their music through their friends and talk about it through their friends. And, you know, in, in China, obviously, you know, the face is, is very important and conspicuous consumption is really important. So you don't, you know, when it comes to, to our project in, in particular, the, um, the merchandise is actually quite important, right? But the, you don't, you don't just want a T-shirt, um, you know, Radiohead T-shirt, for example, because you can you can buy that on Taobao. Um, but you want an autographed T-shirt from Tom York to you, um, and you don't just want an autographed T-shirt from Tom York to you. You want it, and you want to be able to show it, show it off to all your friends, and you know, make sure that they know that you are closer to Tom York than any of them. Right? And that's that's really valuable, and that's actually something that you know that sense of exclusivity and connection and um, closeness to the artist um, in comparison to all your friends with whom you hang out all the time and speak about um, your favorite artist is, is actually very, very valuable. And what, I, what I was fascinated about the research, at least that I saw, was um, uh, I think one of the questions was how, how much would you pay for uh, a basket uh, of ringtones uh, or a basket of downloads that was something between zero uh, and pennies, but then when the proposition was, you know, how much would you pay for uh, regular opportunities to meet your artist, regular opportunities yeah. to get real merch, that suddenly was, people were willing to pay recurring revenue, it was on the order of, you know, one to two US per month, yeah. which turns into actually much more than people, uh, even in mature markets, are generally paying for ringtones and downloads was, and this sort was, of thing. Yeah, it was one of these, um, it was this kind of like, very carefully crafted research questions, right? Um, but the, the, the essence is, you know, again, people don't care, you know, the iTunes idea doesn't work in China, no one cares um, for whether it's high quality or low quality. Maybe they will one day, but we're not gonna wait around and, and see what happens. But they do, they are willing to pay for this sense of exclusivity, right? That, I'll, you know, people are willing to pay 10 kwai a month um, in order to get... That's Buck yeah. fifty, right? Yeah, yeah. A, buck, a buck fifty a month, um, in order to get access to concert tickets three days before everybody, um, and the ability to connect it very quickly with their Sina Weibo and their Kaishin, and tell all their friends that I got tickets to the show three days before <coughs> you. Um, and that that you know when you play into that emotional um, exclusivity demand um, in China, that actually becomes something that's very very valuable. And that that twenty bucks per year is not a lot given the fact that most of these, you know, most of these teenagers <clears throat> and most of this demographic are all carrying $1,000 iPhone sort of thing, right? Yeah, exactly. exactly. That's the case. Matt, are you making money? Well, it's, it's kind of interesting. Uh, you're hearing a lot of stories about people that aren't making money 
and a lot of stories about people that have uh, propositions to make money if we do something else. Uh, Pop Sigma is, a, is about a one-year-old uh, digital marketing agency has paid artists uh, in the hundreds of thousands of dollars from, from brand endorsements. Uh, these are mostly social and media endorsements. These are uh, digital marketing campaigns. The, you know, I kind of want to just, just stop and, and uh, refresh my memory. So the company is less than one year old. Uh, and, and who's on your, your client list thus far? So, uh, you know, everyone from McDonald's, Johnny Walker, Chivas Regal, Oreo, Goodyear, Lipton, and then... In uh, less than a year. Yeah. What, what in the hell happened? Uh, you know, I think... Uh, I, I, I know guys in, you know, advertising and marketing for 20 years in L.A. Uh, who don't have that sort of client list. Well, some of the things that have been happening... Uh, a big thing is that you know marketers have a lot of money to spend, and going back to what Scarlett was saying, you know, look who your customer is. China Mobile is making a lot of money. Uh, you know, until somebody figures out how to, you know, pirate a McDonald's hamburger, uh, you know, the hamburger industry is going to spend a lot of money marketing artists, or or spend a lot of money on, on marketing services. Artists are cool. 99% uh, of people online listen to music. Uh, if a brand wants to be cool online and market themselves, then they have to affiliate themselves with, with cool people. So they will spend on that and they will spend a lot. So a lot of our work is actually engineering a lot of these deals between the brand and the artists. Can I jump in there quickly? Sure. Because I think what uh, the audience finds from all the comments that have been made so far is that it's about creating the ecosystem that works. And uh, I think what you see here is a very good um, representation of very different fields where music is used and commercialized. And uh, this should give you uh, the assurance that, of course, you can make money in China. And, um, you know, this is a good example. But it's, you know, early days, of course, as well. And, uh, you know, of course, it takes time. Uh, but it's a uh, beginning and um, the starting point needs to be made and uh, the services are getting better. People understand ecosystems better as well. You know, their mindset is growing too. And once you get used to good things, you, you know, are hardly um, um, wanting to leave them behind again. You know, as a good service uh, raises the bar. It's like, you know, Scarlett always telling about uh, the quality of stages and sound at the festivals. And that's part of the success. If you provide that, you know, people will, you know, be more likely to come to your festival next year as well and not go to another one where they know the quality of the sound is bad. Same goes for, you know, the quality of music, quality of use, ease of use of, of websites and download services. Um, you know, it needs to be seamless. And uh, we've seen it, you know, in the West. It has taken uh, equally a long time, you know, until well, this was kind of, you know, sorted out. Uh, I think the first, uh, you know, clunky services uh, came up at the end of the 90s or mid of the 90s. And, uh, you know, it took until 2005, almost 10 years, you know, until this became a significant size. That's a good point. That's, I mean, one of the real themes. And <clears throat> at the risk of sounding too terribly cl cliched, I think one of the senses you're getting is that China, uh, at long last, truly has hit a, a real, real tipping point. Uh, and it uh, it wasn't a gentle tip. Uh, it, it it hit with some real force. Scarlett, how you were telling me so you know compared to two or three years ago, how many festival days are you going to do this year compared compared to when you first started? Well, um, I started a festival in 2000, which was the Xue um, uh, San the Snow Mountain Festival. And then subsequently, uh, I was working with Channel V um, News Corp subsidiary company. Um, we started, you know, once a year uh, in 19, 2001 and 2002. And then we started uh, Zebra uh, Music Festival in 2009. And ever after 2009, it's 100% growth every year. Every year. Every right, year. Right. And that's so as you said, that last 18 months, we are entering a tipping point position. So um, I was actually sharing with you, uh, there are several contributions to that. I think, uh, first of all, I think the most important, your audience base. Uh, I think five years ago, 
not much people, I would say 10% of the population would like to pay for a concert or a festival that they actually buy tickets in advance or at the door. But now, you know, with in the uh, first tier cities, um, I think all of the young people, they will pay to entry to a concert or to a festival. So the, the audience base has been cultivated and developed and I think is ready. Um, and the second thing is, I think, the relaxation of the government policy in terms of concert organization. Compares, comparison to five, six, ten years ago, and I think we, we have a tremendous improvement in terms of local government support on such an event, because it's Would, important. Uh, tell us more about this local, it's not Beijing, it's not centralized, what, what do you mean by You know, we government? started our first festival in Chengdu, I don't know if you people know about Chengdu, uh, and they had a big earthquake. Home of the pandas. <laughs> yes. Yeah, the, uh, the home to the pandas. Two, uh, two years ago, we had, 2008, we had, a, was it 2008, we had this huge earthquake in Chengdu, and then I was invited by the mayor to go there to do charity concerts for the first time. And then he brainstormed with me, and he said, you know, can we have something permanent here you can do for us? And uh, I said, let's do a festival together. 10 years deal, you want to do it? <laughs> but I need this, this, and that. <laughs> and uh, he said, okay, I mean, you know. So we had basically a co-founder in the Zebra Music Festival in Chengdu. But it wasn't just Chengdu either, right? Okay, it's so we had a great success in 2009. We had 100,000 people show up over the three days. And then I got invitation from 20 other local governments. China is a big place. It's like in the States, you have many, many places. So um, this may particular mayor in Chengdu promoted, well, it's his um, success as well, so promoted us among the government officials in other regions because there's a network uh, within their own social network. And he you know, shared with the other regions of government is a good way of promoting the city just like Music Matter for Singapore. <laughs> so, um, Jasper, Jasper. <laughs> yes, um, <laughs> we were studying promoting Chengdu Music Matter in China. <laughs> yeah. So we start to, I mean, I didn't go to those provinces, all the provincial government came to me say, can you do music festivals, cultural festivals, or whatever festival for us in that particular region? So I think there is a, an increasing food. open mind of local government in China. And that's, that's real financial support and infrastructure yeah. support. Once they are in, then you won't have censorship issues. Of course, you have to, you know, pre-censor of the artist is going to be on your stage. Uh, we don't want provocative statements on our <laughs> stage. But, you know, once you have them on board, then they support you in terms of the, you know, security, venue management, electricity, all the details of a, you know, concept uh, management. So I'm very happy with that progress um, of, you know, the governments, the local governments recon recognizing the importance of cultural activities in their cities. Yeah. So, so I mean, I want to share just one moment. Sure. Uh, sh share with you is I think it's important to understand a few things um, to make money in China. Uh, you you got to be long term. It's a very big country, and you are you have to willing to invest a few years. I mean, at least five or six years in the business that you are willing to do in China. It's not like a gold rush, you go there and you dig your gold and you leave. That's this, not the this country. This is uh, God's comment about in China, for China, yeah. it just has to, has to be. Right. And recognize um, the local talent and um, uh, consumers. I mean, you are serving, servicing the local talent uh, and uh, market. Uh, quality is important. I think 10 years ago, you can come in and, uh, you know, maybe throw in secondary quality products onto Chinese people, but today we have the internet, we have the Weibo, and we have all information channels, which is pretty open, and, um, and these people are, you know, they recognize good quality products. And I think the people in our, uh, for good quality, you have good quality brands from overseas, I think you will have a chance uh, in China. And our consumers are very bright, very smart, and um, now they are—they have very open-minded 
uh, minds to, you know, to see good products. And the third very important thing is patience. It's very important. I'm not saying that be patient to lose money. <laughs> I'm saying that you, know, you are in it for a long time and you have to be patient to build from the ground uh, gradually. And the fourth thing I want to share with one, uh, with you and only in this room, <laughs> I think for foreign investors in China, I would encourage you more focus on B2C business, not B2B businesses. Oh, but you, you, you could be like WPP, you are servicing all the foreign clients. Your big clients will be P&G, Coca-Cola, whatever, because they are foreigner owned. But if your client base is going to be Chinese, uh, corporate clients, it's going to be difficult for f a foreign player. Mark, uh, well, I, I, <laughs> I was going to say, what do you think about Mark well, doing B2B solutions? You know, yes. I, I guess. That's my experience. And, and what do you think about Matt, you know, working with, yeah, uh, yeah, yeah. with agencies and, uh, and brands? Let's yeah. start with Mark. Just, just, just last point. So, so after, uh, you know, following that point is that if you are doing B2C marketing, we are in the B2B business because I serve China Mobile and China Telecom. Yeah. Yeah, two sure. very major yeah. clients, and they, they contribute 50% of my revenue in my company group. Um, but if you're into B2C business, I think it's now, it's a, what do you see, a blue ocean. You can go in there, but build brands from the ground. You will own the brand, and nobody can take away that brand, just like PNG in China. Right. right. So, I mean, B2C, yes, blue ocean, huge, big, fairly untapped, but it... it <sighs> B2B B2 is where the money is. It's where people are willing to pay, whereas B2C at the moment, the standard is that people pay nothing. And it's very hard to persuade people to pay money in an environment where they haven't been paying it before. If I offer you a free version and a paid version, well, gee, if they're the same, why would you pay money? So B2C, I mean, okay, fine. It's a big blue ocean. There may be potential there, but that's... I, I, I think B2B is where money is now. B2C is going to be a huge risk. That's, that's going to take why some I real said long term. We're okay. paying for the shampoos produced by P&G. We're paying Coca-Cola. Right. We're paying right. McDonald's. We're paying Kentucky Fried Chicken. All right. We're all and, of that. and to be fair, Two Muse is, is a pretty domestic company. It's all PRC management. You're sort of the odd man, Western guy. But I agree um, with you. The money now is B2B because you can get the money directly from the client direct. But there's a lot of management issues in B2B. On the, on the, B2, on the B2B side, You need side, to have Matt. very good people on the ground, which I think you are. Very good people, pe people on the ground because you're dealing with very large bills. You've been, well, yeah, you've I been just have to, have to jump in on that because obviously we're, we're also B2B business. One, one big thing that I think Shen Li Hui pointed out in the last panel was uh, your focus on the artist, not just the music. Uh, I think it's very important to, to market and promote and put your artist uh, in a good position, uh, even if it's a if if it's a foreign artist, uh, and there's tons of Chinese brands that are you know uh, paying top dollar for for foreign celebrities, uh, not just musicians, but sort of celebrities in general. So uh, and and there's a lot of foreign celebrities that are actually getting getting their presence online and in, in, in social media on Chinese Weibo, and then they are uh, in very good position to land uh, endorsement deals. Uh, you know, of all different sizes, uh, digital endorsements, micro endorsements uh, within China. And that's, uh, that's a business that makes money. It's a business that makes money now. Uh, and, you know, it's for those people that, that are committed to that. So uh, I'd say, you know, if you are, you know, committed to China and you want to make money in the short term, uh, look at how you're building up your, your artist brand uh, and do smart marketing and promotion around that. I'll bite. And, uh, and ask you a hard question. Is it making money, great business? <clears throat> um, man up, tell us how much you made last year. Confidential. <laughs> <laughs> I'll pass on that. <laughs> cough, cough once if it's over a million US. <coughs> cough once if it's over, Sorry. cough once if it's over half a million US. Uh, so I mean, I, I think it's start, <laughs> hey, startup hey, business. Hey. Startup business, okay. Uh, you know, for startup business, 12, 12 month old business in China. Yeah, there's there's real money. There's there's real money sloshing around, particularly in the in the the brand tank. Uh, what I think is very very interesting from 
the standpoint of how the Chinese market has developed, there hasn't been that much money that's been going into the ecosystem for developing Chinese music and Chinese artists. 35% uh, of the music that's listened to on Cena Music is foreign, is uh, foreign and overseas artists. Which is a lot higher or, than Japan and a lot of other markets. It's, it's, extremely, it's extremely high. Uh, you know, because the way that the Chinese uh, entertainment industry has developed, it's not been very even. So what you have is a small number of celebrities at the top that are commanding, uh, you know, commanding top, top dollar, and then you've got a bunch of uh, reality show participants. In the middle, there are not that many there are not that many artists that offer a good value for the brand. So a lot of times brands, whether it's Chinese brands, uh, you know, Chinese brands go overseas to get, a, to get a celebrity deal because it's actually a much better value for them. Uh, instead of getting uh, you know, a Chinese celebrity for 1.5 uh, million US, you know, that would be in that top tier that everybody recognizes, they go into the middle tier and they can grab somebody from overseas for, for say half a million US. Uh, there's real money out there. The Western, Japanese, Korean markets have developed, they've developed in a, in a much uh, different way. So when you have, uh, you have a, uh, artists pretty much at every price level that, that people understand uh, and can associate with, uh, you just have a lot more options for, for Chinese brands to, to get, whether it's a traditional two plus one sort of uh, one-year celebrity endorsement deal, or whether it's just an online digital campaign deal, or whether it's over for a series of uh, a series of shows or, or or corporate performances. So, one of the things I've been fascinated about is, you know, especially in the music industry historically, it was you know, it was sound scan numbers and sell through, and how many CDs did we move last month? Uh, and in a market where the way you know, and the ways in which the consumer is paying for music and the music experience has nothing to do, frankly, with physical and, and largely digital sales. There's a real question in terms of, well, how in the hell do you quantify how you're doing, where you are uh, in the market? And John, I think that's one of the things that you've, uh, you've been working on at Gravity. Well, yeah, and, and to extend on from Matt's point about uh, sort of building your artist brand in the marketplace, without any metrics, I'm, I, I like numbers. Uh, and in China, it's the most frustrating market to be in because there really are no numbers. The sales figures don't exist. Um, everything you look at, all the forecasts are constantly changing. Uh, and it's hard to, you can identify who's the top, like Matt said, but everybody in between, uh, it's, it's almost impossible really to estimate how, that in, how, they're, being, um, how they're being consumed by their fan base uh, in the marketplace. And one of, the, one of the great things about the sort of the social media revolution right now that we're seeing uh, across the world is that in China, um, they're already all digital. They've, you know, I think yesterday there were some great points that people were discussing about access versus ownership. Um, just like Chan China skipped the fax, they skipped the VHS, uh, they skipped the, uh, skipped the cassette tape, um, they're gonna jump right into the access model. Uh, and everything that I think everybody here is talking about uh, in terms of Mark, um, Scarlet, uh, we're talking about access to uh, products that you can't pirate. Um, products that you that the individuals actually want, and they'll pay they'll pay for that access. Uh, so one of the things that we're trying to do now is, um, and actually, uh, in the last panel they were talking about how Twitter's not available in China, Facebook isn't available, YouTube isn't available. Um, the interesting part about that having a closed ecosystem is that by looking at that ecosystem, we get a very good image of what Chinese consumers and users are doing. Um, we're not looking at a Facebook, which is a, a global phenomenon, and trying to parse out what are the Chinese people doing. By looking at the China, entire Chinese social media ecosystem, uh, we can look at uh, how artists are doing. Uh, we can look at how many music videos are being watched, how much music is being streamed, how many followers they have on Sino Weibo. Uh, so what we're trying to do at Gravity is, is we've, we've put together a, an analytic system to sort of track this, and, and we're looking at the full spectrum of artists. We're looking at everybody at the top uh, and emerging artists, and we're trying, to, we're trying to quantify how are you doing in the Chinese marketplace. Uh, assuming we're, we're completely throwing out sales figures, and we're looking at, uh, we're looking at like Scarlett said, like a blue ocean strategy. These is, this is uncharted territory, uh, not just in China and a lot of other markets, um, but you know, these are the drivers for... Especially in China. Yeah. Especially in China. Um, you know, these are going to be the levers and the drivers in the future 
about how you're going to make an artist, how you're going to break an artist in China. They're going to have to be in the digital ecosystem. Um, so we're advising our clients by taking this information and, and telling them which artists, um, you know, it's a combination of uh, the online space, it's also a combination of other activities they might be doing uh, in person in China, and, and coming back to them and showing them, okay, on a, on a score of zero to 100, um, this is where your artist ranks, and we're also trying to find out uh, the, the triggers and the critical mass that we see that is needed for an artist to actually have a presence in China that makes sense for them to come to China. Uh, we've got management companies that have been asking us not just which artists should they bring, but they're asking us for information about artists so that they can go back to the artist and tell the artist that they're not ready for the Chinese market yet, so that they don't have to... And what, the, what they need to do before they're, they're What ready. they need to do, and uh, so what we're trying to do is we're trying to... It's, it's, China's a very, it's a very, it's a huge market, but it's very dark. Uh, we're trying to put a light on it. We're trying to turn the light on so that people can see what's happening, where it's happening, and what's working. Thomas, I know this is one of your themes too, this whole sort of absence of information. There's a lot of complaint about there's no transparency, there's no clarity, reporting can't be trusted, but what's, what's your approach to this? Uh, it's, uh, well, we are working every day you know, for more transparency. And I think uh, when we set up 88, that was one of the big uh, messages that we gave out. We don't work with sites that are not reporting. We are not working with free sites. What we want to achieve is an economical turnaround, you know, a financial exchange. And uh, hence the only thing that we were left with were the mobile uh, companies, right? And uh, of course, you know, Sina is offering a paid for download site, <coughs> but you know, um, once you get into that sphere, I think you know you can lose control and what you are offering as a channel very easily. So we don't do that. We concentrate on that, and we want to do it, you know, very well and start to expand and branch into more services. Because of course, you know, once you have your music sitting there, it needs to be promoted. You know, it needs to be integrated, and uh, that's what we're doing as well. In general, <coughs> the Chinese market. Um, is less mysterious than everybody thinks. Um, I've been going there for the past six years, you know, very, very often and very regularly. And the more I, you know, there are less and less surprises in it, actually. Everybody wants to make money. People are interested in making deals. And uh, you just, you know, have to consider, you know, some uh, specific things, but those specific things, you know, are in every market. I'm from Germany, you know, that's also very special, you know, it's like communication in Germany is a difficult thing. The American market is a special market and, you know, China is just in that realm too. Mm -hmm. And I think the more people understand that and we can only encourage that, the more business will be done. And um, this is, you know, one of our, you know, primary goals to put the message out uh, to everybody to, you know, invite them to come over and try it. I think, you know, you find a, a, a trustworthy ecosystem begins to develop. Great, I think thanks. I think we're running out of time, so uh, I'm getting the high sign here. If we've got, uh, if anyone has any questions, I think we've got time for one or two. Uh, gentleman in front. Hi. Uh, um, are you mentioning about the good revenue from you guys that having from the advertisers, and you mentioning again the, the face that you are facing with the B2C market. Uh, are any, uh, any uh, running service in China that is more like uh, without changing the habit of B2C with the people get the music for free? Are there any advertising funded download in China? There are. Um, <coughs> the, uh, the sort of the, uh, you want to talk about top 100? <laughs> Well, not, don't it's announce a big the new deal, deal going but on. the old deal with, uh, with Gary and Google, right? right. It's probably the, the well, most. Well, I mean, Google, uh, well, it's a complicated story. Three years ago, Google, sorry, three years? Three years ago, Google launched uh, advertising support, a free download service in China due to uh, their competition, Baidu, which now owns 80% of the market of our search engine market in China. Uh, Baidu has been offering um, free, non-paid, um, non-subsidized, <laughs> non-advertising shared music for the last 10 years. And, uh, and they started from attracting all these free, um, uh, free interest uh, in music download uh, as a search engine. So 
uh, you know, because of the competition, so Google decides three years ago. They, the the yeah. short answer is they exist. They're, they're, they're not a great model for content owners in, uh, in China, and there's better stuff coming. Uh, one more very quick question. Can I, I just want to try and pin down, I've heard varying figures about the proportion of domestic to international. I think somebody said 35%. I realize the figures are all over the place, but I'm hearing anything from 95% domestic to, you sort of said something like 65%. Can anybody give me a clear idea? Because if it's mainly domestic, that's surely where a lot of the efforts, working out how to joint venture with domestic acts. Really depends I mean, on the demographic, but I'll say one thing. I think the universal yeah. opinion is that the appetite for uh, Western repertoire it's actually going to be much, much higher in China over time than we've seen from, say, uh, Japan and Korea. Uh, we've got to wrap up, but uh, I would encourage you to Clar clarify that last one. But China Mobile, Western music on China Mobile has been about one to two percent uh, from from my sources. Sina music, which is concentrated on primarily first tier cities, you know, it's a couple hundred million consumers that are in first tier cities and have a higher spending power, listen to a much higher. Percentage. That's where that 35% uh, figure came from. So, thank you, everyone. Thank you.